straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. A hefty bond is set for the parents of accused Michigan school shooter. These two individuals could have stopped it, and they had every okay. reason to know that he was dangerous, and they gave him a weapon. We need an opportunity to fight this case in court and not in the court of public opinion. And he is solely responsible for his wife's death because he murdered her. Bill Argy answered for you, and at the time he was arraigned on the charges. I am not guilty. Hear closing arguments from both sides before a verdict is announced in the trial of William Argy. Plus, so now she goes to plan B, and she realizes that the, pill, the poison didn't work, so she's got to find somebody to shoot it. It is impossible for this woman to have killed Van Ryan. We hear opening statements from both sides as a Missouri woman stands trial for the murder of her husband. And later, ex-cop Kim Potter to stand trial for the death of Dante Wright. We break down Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A combined $1 million bond is set for the parents of the accused Michigan high school shooter. This after police announced the, quote, fugitives are arrested after a manhunt in Detroit. On Saturday, Jennifer and James Crumbly both entered not guilty pleas to four counts, each of involuntary manslaughter. This comes just days after their son, Ethan Crumbly, was charged on multiple counts, including terrorism causing death, first-degree murder, and assault with intent to murder. Ethan Crumbly also entered a not guilty plea. All charges stem from the deadly shooting on November 30th, when officials say 15-year-old Crumbly opened fire at Oxford High School. Four students were killed and eight injured. On Friday, prosecutors announced the charges against Jennifer and James Crumbly, saying they ignored warning signs and gave their son access to the weapon. During an arraignment on Saturday, prosecutors allege the couple fled Oakland County without plans to return. They didn't turn themselves in, and uh, we were told they were out of town, except that yesterday morning they withdrew uh, $4,000 from an ATM in Rochester Hills, uh, very close to the court where they could have turned themselves in with no um, events and no uh, um, efforts on behalf of law, law enforcement. Instead, they fled, and they, they sought multiple attempts to hide their location and were eventually tracked down after they uh, parked their car somewhere. A witness saw it, and the entire fugitive apprehension team, with multiple other law enforcement agencies, went into a uh, vacant building and searched it from top to bottom, and these two individuals were found locked somewhere in a room hiding. These are not people that we can be assured will return to court um, on their own. In the same arraignment hearing over the weekend, the Crumbly's attorneys countered the prosecution's claim that the pair ran off, saying they planned to turn themselves in on Saturday morning, and their arrests were unnecessary. Last night and throughout the day, we were in contact with our clients. They, they were scared, they were terrified, they were not at home. They were figuring out what to do, getting finances in order. And the last text messages we had with them and phone calls Marielle Lehman and I had with them, our plan was to drive to the Novi District Court this morning because arraignments were supposed to start at 8.30 for any county arraignment. And we had plans to meet them at 7.30 to text the fugitive apprehension team to get to the court by 8.30 so they could be arraigned first thing. Those were plans we made and solidified and we did not announce it because unlike the prosecution, we weren't attempting to make this a media, a media spectacle. Joining us today is law and crime legal analyst Mike Korobonics and Terry Austin. Mike, the Crumbly's attorney, argued their clients weren't fleeing, as you heard, and requested a $50,000 bond. What do you think led the judge to set a half a million dollar bond each? I think it was the very fact, Brian, that I didn't think the attorney's argument was very strong about their clients not turning themselves in. Usually, Brian, as we know, if, if someone is turning themselves in, you don't show up at court. You usually contact the prosecutor's office, tell them you're representing them, and that would you want us to turn them in now or can we turn them in at court? But those are things you work out prior to just showing up at court. So I think the judge saw that and knows the practicality of how you turn in a client. So it was questioning whether or not it needed some more assurance that they do show up at the next court date if in fact they make bail.
Yeah, and I didn't hear it at the arraignment, but interesting fact, Oxford and Detroit, only 40 minutes away from each other, but Detroit, right next to the Canadian border, kind of raises an eyebrow there. Now, Terry, Michigan is no stranger to prosecuting parents with involuntary manslaughter. In these types of cases, what does it mean to be grossly negligent? And this could be a, could this be a growing trend? Well, I guess it could be a growing trend. And we have seen these types of cases in Michigan, but really it has to do with when a parent has been negligent in connection with their child getting access to a gun and using it and using it against some other children. We haven't really seen it in connection with a mass shooting like this. Michigan, remember, doesn't have any law that the parent has to keep the gun locked up in any way. So you have to show there's this egregious error and that they're grossly negligent. And that's what the prosecution is saying she can do here because there were so many missed opportunities. Absolutely. Interesting case and see how they're going to prosecute not only the school shooter, but the parents. This is a unique situation in Michigan. Switching now to New York, where Monday marks the start of week two in the federal sex crimes trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. The 59-year-old faces sex trafficking charges for allegedly helping her longtime companion, Jeffrey Epstein, groom young teenage girls for sexual abuse. Epstein was found dead by suicide two years ago, just months after his arrest on similar charges. Much of the testimony during the week one of the trial centered around former employees of Epstein's, detailing his properties and those who visited them. In court Monday, a witness identified by the pseudonym Kate took the stand, testifying she spent time with both Maxwell and Epstein. Kate told jurors she met Maxwell while on vacation in Paris with a boyfriend. She said Maxwell later introduced her to Epstein when she was 17 years old. Kate told jurors when Epstein's massage therapist canceled, Maxwell asked her to fill in, wearing a schoolgirl outfit. She said Epstein initiated sexual contact with her. Afterwards, Kate says Maxwell complimented her for, quote, being a good girl. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, four years after his death, a Missouri woman stands trial for the murder of her famed snake breeder husband. But first, a New Hampshire jury decides the fate of accused wife murderer William Argy. What verdict the jury came to after this. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. After just hours of deliberation, a jury reaches a verdict in the case of William Argy on trial for the murder of his wife. Prosecutors say Argy strangled or suffocated his wife, Maureen, in 2019. After that, they say he attempted suicide, ran off, and gambled at a casino. Argy's defense maintained his wife committed suicide and that he found her in bed with a sheet around her neck. At the time of her death, R.G. faced a gambling addiction, mounting debt, and job loss. He also was a sole beneficiary of his wife's $400,000 life insurance policy. On Monday, the prosecution delivered its closing arguments, saying R.G. is to blame for the death of his wife. Maureen R.G. didn't take her own life. She had her life stolen from her. A new life. A life that she had every reason to live for and a new life that she had every reason to look forward to. Because it was going to be a life free from the anchor who had weighed her and her children down for so long. And he was that anchor, draining them of their money, of their home, of their future. And she finally was going to cut that anchor free. And he would not allow that. So he squeezed the life out of his wife while she slept and was at her most vulnerable. He took Maureen's life while the children who she cared so much for and had every reason to live for slept just down the hall. But the defense maintained R.G. found his wife dead, saying she committed suicide. In their closing arguments, R.G.'s team said bias against him played a role in the case. 
The entries do not tell it was done by another person beyond a reasonable doubt. Remember what Trooper Anderson said, what the investigators were told after the, office, the autopsy was concluded. He said that the cause and manner of death had not been determined, was inconclusive. When the medical examiner completed her report on May 14, 2019, she was still not absolutely certain. She said probable homicide by asphyxiation. She held that opinion until the night before she testified. She even held that opinion while I examined her by deposition this summer. What changed her mind? Two years of added experience to who already two years of experience? Or was it bias? The bias of information that this was a contentious divorce? After hearing closing arguments from both sides, the jury deliberated for only a few hours before announcing a verdict. Mr. Foreperson, how say you? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the charge of first degree murder? Guilty. The foreperson has says guilty as to that charge. So say you all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Yes. For the crime, Argy could face life in prison. His sentencing is set for Tuesday. Back to discuss the latest in the Argy trial is law and crime legal analyst Mike Korobonics and Terry Austin. Terry, were you surprised with the speed of this verdict? Brian, I was not surprised. Two and a half hours, less than three hours, was not something that I thought was out of the usual here because I think there was so much evidence against him. No one else came in and out of that home. He didn't call 911. After the murder, he went gambling. He discarded the cell phones. So this whole evidence against him is just overwhelming, plus this claim of suicide is just unreasonable. She had every single thing to live for, as you heard the prosecution say. She got a promotion. She was going to leave him. She had her children. So I'm not at all surprised. And Brian, remember, he got on the stand, and he was not a good witness for himself. So I'm not surprised the jury came back so quickly with guilty. Yeah, not surprised at all. Mike, legal analyst, federal, state, defense attorney, also former prosecutor. This seems like an open and shut verdict, but there's always an appeal. Do you see this case getting overturned for any reason? Not really, Brian, not at all, because as Terry pointed out, it was such a strong case with evidence. Sometimes you have appeals are mainly in uh, jury instructions and things of that nature, but this was a very direct case. And I think what also hurts on the appeal is it doesn't help on an appeal when your client testifies, because now it sort of takes a much of the pressure of the prosecution's burden of proof, because now you're said to the jury, we're going to disprove the case and we're going to give you some evidence as well. All right, we'll see how it plays out. Of course, there's always typically an appeal. Whether or not it goes anywhere is really the question. And if there is one, we'll be sure to give you a follow up here on Law and Crime Daily. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, a jury is seated and ex-cop Kim Potter prepares for her first day in court. We break down what her charges mean ahead. Plus, a Missouri woman stands trial for the murder of her famous snake breeder husband. We'll take you in. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. A world famous snake breeder is shot and killed inside his Missouri reptile house. Four years later, his wife is on trial for the murder. 31-year-old Lynn Lee Rennick is charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action after her husband, 29-year-old Benjamin Rennick, was found shot and killed at his reptile shop back in 2017. Prosecutors say Lynn Lee Rennick hatched a plan to kill her husband with her ex-boyfriend, Anthony Humphrey, and co-worker Ashley Shaw. They say she owned a spa that was losing money and was the sole beneficiary of her husband's $1 million life insurance policy. Years later, Lindley Rennick's other ex-boyfriend, Brandon Blackwell, came forward to the police with information about the murder. On Monday, both sides gave opening statements. The prosecution explained that Lindley resorted to shooting her husband after a failed attempt to poison him. So Lindley, who's also the sole beneficiary of the $1 million life insurance policy on Ben Rennick, decides she's going to kill him. And she can't divorce him because Ben controls the money and Ben has the money. And she thinks if she tries to divorce him, that he's going to keep her kids from her. 
So she doesn't want a divorce. She's going to kill him. So her and Ashley come up with this plan to poison him. And the plan is that Lindley is going to blend up some pills in a protein shake. She actually gets 15 Percocets and gives them to Lindley. Lindley blends them up, puts them in the shake, gives it to Ben. Now Ben gets violently ill, but it doesn't kill him. So now she goes to plan B, and she realizes that the, pill, the poison didn't work, so she's got to find somebody to shoot him. In the defense opening statements, attorneys told the jury they can prove Lindley Rennick did not kill her husband. All of these people know the facts just by being around the investigation. They don't know these facts because what they're saying is actually true. They're just using those facts to substantiate, oh a, to, to, to make themselves be believed. Learn to wear a tie. So basically, what the state is going to say is, here are some witnesses, they say she did it, and they know things about the case, that's all they're going to be able to say. And at the end of our case, we are going to be able to give you five reasons why it is impossible for this woman to have killed Ben Rennick. Let's bring back legal analyst Mike Korobonics and co-host Terry Austin to break down one of these new trials that we're looking at now. Terry. Benjamin Rennick was going to sell his snake collection for over $1.2 million. Do you think the defense will say that's a motive for someone else to kill Rennick? And does that make sense to you? Well, it does make sense, but I don't think that they're going to go there. I think the first thing the defense is going to try to do is poke holes in the prosecution's case. We already saw on the cross-examination of the accomplice, Alice, I mean, I guess her name is Ashley Shaw, Oh my gosh, the defense went right after her and attacked her and said, you know, you're a religious person, you've never been involved in any crimes, you have children, why would you ever want to murder someone or help anyone murder someone? So I think he attacked her and basically the motive at the end of the day, I think the defense is going to try to say, was with the other individual, was with the one who pulled the trigger. So I think he's going to rely mostly on this Michael Humphrey guy and basically say that everything else you hear, don't believe. Interesting. And I would agree. That sounds like a good defense tactic. Mike, with Humphrey and Shaw testifying against the defendant, did the defense create any potential, I don't know, reasonable doubt in their opening statements? I don't know, Brian. There's nothing more valuable than the defense attorney's word and opening statement. They delivered, they promised to deliver five key facts to show that she didn't commit this crime. We're going to have to see and see if they could keep their word. All right, we'll keep an eye out on this trial as it continues. Thank you, everyone. When we come back, we're just days away from opening statements and the trial of ex-Minnesota police officer Kim Potter. We're breaking down her charges and the deadly shooting that led up to the trial next. Welcome back. Now to Minnesota, where the jury is seated and opening arguments are set to begin Wednesday in the trial of ex-cop Kim Potter. Twelve men and women make up the jury, along with two alternates. There are seven men and seven women, 11 of whom are white, two are Asian, and one is black. Potter faces first and second degree manslaughter charges in the shooting death of Dante Wright. It happened back in April in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. Police pulled right over for an expired registration tag when they determined he had an outstanding warrant. When they attempted to take him into custody, police say he resisted. Body camera video shows Potter warning Wright that she is going to tase him, but pulls her gun out instead. Potter shot Wright in the chest. He later died as a result of the injuries. Potter's defense maintains the shooting was an accident. The max sentence for first-degree manslaughter is 15 years behind bars, plus a $30,000 uh, fine. The second-degree manslaughter charge carries 10 years and a $20,000 fine. The two main charges Kim Potter is facing, manslaughter in the first degree and second degree, so let's break it down with our own experts. Mike, manslaughter in the first degree almost looks like a misdemeanor murder charge. Can you break it down for us? Well. It always becomes this thing of where there's no specific intent, and it's really basically a conscious disregard for the safety of others when you know there's a great risk. So I think this is a much easier case for the prosecution to, to prove than a murder case, because with murder, you always need some sort of specific intent. Here is something that's sort of 
developed, yet she didn't use proper procedures and it was reckless and she disregarded those procedures. Yeah, and that's a big point of this too, because you're not going to hear a lot of us, at least here on Law and Crime Data, saying she intended to she do this or intended to do that, because that's not really the standard. Intent isn't really there. It's a little bit lower with these manslaughter charges. Now, Terry, manslaughter in the second degree, what is that and how does manslaughter differ from murder? Well, manslaughter in the second degree, the prosecution is going to have to show there was some sort of culpable negligence which created this unreasonable risk. And as you said, there is a 10-year penalty for that and a $20,000 fine. So the prosecution is basically going to have to say, if they can't say that she was reckless using this firearm, they are going to say she was unreasonable in doing so. And the murder charge, which the family wanted and didn't get, is that it was premeditation, that there was intent to kill. And frankly, I don't think that the prosecution brought that because that would be difficult under these circumstances to prove, particularly with that video. It's going to be interesting in case I would suspect that we're going to hear a lot of use of force experts and probably the Minneapolis Police Department trying to separate themselves from Kim Potter and the way she operated herself that day. Well, thank you, Mike and Terry, and thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.